Charlie makes a statement, whether it's sitting by the curb or going down the road. There's no other motorcycle like it. Life is definitely different on a Harley. It's the Ferrari of bikes. Very good things happen on a Harley Davidson. Had it for me for 15 years. Today, Harley-Davidson enthusiasts are everyone from kids and racers to carpenters and school teachers, small business owners, to corporate CEOs and movie stars. Motorcycles and Harleys have come a long way. Thing I think I love you. But I want to know for sure. Come on, hold me tight. You move me. Wild thing. You make my heart sing. You make everything move me. Wild thing. Wild thing, I think I love you. In the 1890s, the bicycle was a popular mode of transportation, despite the poor state of the roads, which were better suited to the horse and carriage. Inventors were toying with the idea of a motorized bicycle, and in 1895, Daimler built the first motorcycle out of wood with a single-cylinder engine. In 1901, 21-year-old William Harley and 20-year-old Arthur Davidson decided to build a motor-powered two-wheeler, Arthur promised another brother, Walter, a ride on it when he came into town for a wedding. Little did Walter realize that he would have to put it together himself before riding it, and that he would get caught up in their dream. The history of Harley-Davidson officially begins in 1903 with these three friends building by hand a motorized bicycle. Only when a friend asked them to build one for him did they realize other people might want them. Coincidentally, in 1903, Henry Ford founded the Ford Motor Company and built his Model A. In 1904, working in their spare time, the three friends built three identical black cycles with De Dion type single cylinder engines similar to this 1906 version. Notice the leather belt drive. Their aunt, Janet Davidson, created the original Harley-Davidson Motor Company logo seen on the fuel tank. In 1907, another brother, William A. Davidson, joined them, and they formed a corporation. That year, they completed about 150 motorcycles. Steadily, their production increased, and they were able to fully devote themselves to their new company. Walter Davidson, the president of the company, in 1908, after winning the American Federation of Motorcycles endurance run. In 1909, the results of Bill Harley's experiments with twin cylinders created a Harley-Davidson trademark, the 45-degree V-twin. The single-cylinder engines had used what was called a vacuum-operated intake valve, which didn't work well with two cylinders on one carburetor, so they put the mechanically operated intake valves on this motorcycle, creating a very successful twin. 1913 was the first year for the chain drive. It had two chains because it still had bicycle pedals to pedal and start it. The brake operated by reversing the bicycle pedals. It was capable of speeds over 60 miles per hour. 1914 was the first year the footboard was added, so you didn't have to rest your foot on the pedals. The handle on the gas tank is a gear shift used to operate a two-speed transmission located in the back axle. It was only used for this one year. They were nicknamed Silent Gray Fellows because they were all painted gray up until 1918 and ran quietly for their time, unlike today's Harleys. 
1915 marked major changes. The bike now had a three-speed transmission, and it came with electric lights, tail lights, electric horn, and battery. The small lever on the side of the primary case is an auxiliary hand clutch. You still use the pedals to start. Rather than take your left foot off the pedal, which was actually the starter, to use the foot clutch, you moved the hand clutch in and out until you got started and then went to the foot clutch so that your left hand could then control the spark, horn, and steering. This 1915 motorcycle proudly stands in the window of the Dudley Perkins Harley-Davidson dealership in San Francisco. Founded in 1914, it's one of the oldest family-run dealerships in the world. It's run today by the founder's son and grandsons, and it represents the Harley tradition of quality, history, riding and racing what you sell, and a close rapport with its customers. This is home away from home for a lot of our customers. We call it Dudley's home for wayward boys. In 1929, Gordon, Walter, and Alan Davidson visit the dealership on their 8,000-mile ride around the country. My father uh, lived, breathed, and ate Harley-Davidson all of his life. Dudley Sr. was originally a board track racer, but when he got married, his wife forbade that kind of competition because it was so dangerous. So he took up hill climbing because it's uh, a straight line uphill and it's very hard to kill yourself that way. And he then went on to become a champion hill climber in the United States for years, right up until the war. Between 1914 and 1921, Harley Davidson assembled a top-notch racing team dubbed the Wrecking Crew whose successes changed Harley's reputation from slow and reliable to invincible. In 1921, Otto Walker averaged 104 miles per hour on a Harley Davidson. A Chicago club rally in 1912. People checking out each other's bikes just like today. From its beginnings, the motorcycle and Harley in particular inspired the kind of affection and dedication that spawned clubs and even uniforms not unlike the way it is today with hog chapters all over the world. Harley owners proudly show their brand loyalty and club affiliations. It's a wonderful feeling and there's a camaraderie of people that you have friends everywhere you go. And there's no other motorcycle club that does that in the whole world. And Harleys are just Harleys. And what do you do? I'm a librarian. <laughs> I'm an airline pilot. I'm a carpenter. I'm a communications professor. I'm a stockbroker. Don't I look like one? <laughs> well, I'm a security compliance inspector for the Defense Department. Yeah, I work in an auto body shop. I'm a body man and painter. I'm a fundraiser. I raise money for the United States Chamber of Commerce. When you ride a Harley, every walk of life uh, is in a Harley, but there's no difference between me being uh, a retired businessman and a Hells Angels. Uh, we're all friendly. Uh, when you ride a Harley, you're friendly. You're coming from the same, same place with that experience that kind of crosses over. So you'll get, you know, the diehard bikers uh, or uh, the uh, stockbrokers or uh, businessmen and, uh, you know, different people in the arts. And it's just a crossover. It's an equalizer. You know, the common ground is the road and the wind and the Harley Davidson you're riding. Not only does it bring different people together, but also families. Okay, we're from Fresno, California. And we come down to Palm Springs to ride to Phoenix with my mom and dad. In April 1917, the United States entered World War I, and Harley-Davidson devoted all its efforts to military production, producing 8,000 of these bikes. This is a 1918 Army bike. The bikes changed color from gray to olive drab, a paint shade that continued for some years after the war. Conservative as always, the Army would not accept electric lights, so it has the old carbide gas headlight. The canister under the handlebars has carbide and water in it. You opened a valve and let water drip into the carbide 
and that makes the acetylene gas for the headlight. William S. Harley checks out the performance of one of these army bikes. Corporal Roy Holtz, riding a Harley, was the first American to enter Germany, November 11, 1918. After World War I, the new bikes, such as this 1919, were radically different. This is a horizontal two-cylinder. The back cylinder tended to overheat. That could have easily been cured, but you couldn't cure the attitude of the Harley-Davidson customers who were just as ornery then as now. If you make what we want, we'll buy it. So because it didn't sound or look like a Harley, they didn't buy it. After trying it for three years, Harley-Davidson stopped making it. This 1923 is one of the JD models which were introduced in 1921. The JD was a solid, simple engine, one valve up, one valve down, and it lasted for nine years on the 74 cubic inch big engines. This bike was specially painted black for a police department. It has another gear on the back wheel that drives the speedometer. This is the foot clutch, the backup hand lever, and the shifter lever. By 1921, there were Harley-Davidson dealers in 67 countries and catalogs printed in seven foreign languages. In 1924, nearly half of the 13,942 machines built were exported. This is a 1926 BA 21 cubic inch sports single. It was available with either a side valve model B or overhead valve model BA engine. It marks the first appearance of the teardrop gas tank. It had a foot operated brake assembly, foot clutch and footboard, battery box, and the shifter relay linkage. Due to assembly line innovations, Henry Ford could sell his Model T for $245, which was less than many motorcycles. This, combined with the devastating stock market crash of 1929, temporarily hurt sales. But Harley-Davidson had aggressively and successfully gone after law enforcement contracts all over the country and so were less affected and still managed to make a profit. These lucky officers of the West Virginia State Police are outfitted with Harleys. These are Royal Canadian Mounties. They also had contracts with Western Union and rural post offices. This is a postal stamp honoring Harley-Davidson. They also created motorcycle trucks. The 1929 DL was popular with riders who wanted the power of a twin combined with the nimbleness of a single. The 45 cubic inch side valve rapidly established a reputation for top dependability and performance. It was also the second year of the front brake. A three-speed here sitting in neutral. Dual headlights. It no longer looks like a bicycle. The 1932 VL 74 cubic inch produced 28 horsepower capable of going 90 miles per hour. It had balloon tires, knockout axles, a lower seating position, crossover brake mechanism, an air filter that looks more like a hair dryer, the teardrop gas tank, the front brake, a flat horn mounted on a toolbox and enclosed light. Ironically, in the mid-30s, Harley-Davidson licensed to a Japanese consortium the blueprints of then-current Harley-Davidson models. This accounts for the similarity between many of the Japanese bikes and Harley. But they are far from the same thing, as Harley owners enthusiastically report.
I've been riding for about 30 years, and I've ridden all kinds of bikes, but I prefer the American Harley Davidson. It just kind of has the X factor, you know, it's fun. And the other bikes are more like uh, toasters, they're utensils, you know. But this is a very fine machine. The finest machine I've ever owned, two or four wheels. We asked a number of owners, what does it feel like when you ride your Harley? Probably the way a Plains Indian felt, heading across the plains with no one to stop him. You feel like an outlaw, like a cowboy. Feels like you own the world. You're free, you own the world, nobody bothers you. I feel very free when I ride my bike. Ecstasy. Very comfortable. Hope to be doing it till we're 90. Why, Harley, it's all there is. It's the best there is, you know. <laughs> Just go for a ride, yeah. one block in low gear, <laughs> low gear and, you'll, be and sold. you'll do anything. <laughs> oh, like you're floating on a cloud, like you died and gone to heaven. This is a 1936 ULH. It has an 80 cubic inch high compression flathead V-twin engine. This is still the largest available engine. It was the last year with the total loss oiling system. The 37 had an oil pump. It has the Art Deco Eagle Tank logo. The speedometer is mounted on the tank and we follow the cable down to an enclosed gear. The transmission unit with bicycle kicker pedal. The rear brake pedal. The ride control friction dampener, which changed the tension on the front end for a softer or harder ride. As the depression eased, production increased, and in 1937, sales reached over 11,000. 
This is a 1938 WLD 45 cubic inch highest compression sports solo V-twin. Externally mounted distributor. Foot brake and footboard. Fishtail exhaust. The drive chain is on the opposite side to the 74, but the same side as the Sportster. Sprung seat. Deco tank. Speedometer mounted on a tank dash. Tension adjustment. Front fender light. And it also has more chrome on it. This beautifully restored 1938 motorcycle is at the Bartels Harley Davidson dealership in Los Angeles, California. Harley Davidson owners are devoted to their machines like nobody else. Any given Saturday, they'll stop by their local dealership, and any Sunday the weather's nice, they'll be out riding. Not because they have to get somewhere, but for the pleasure of the ride. They've got the fever. This 1940 EL 61 cubic inch overhead valve knucklehead was restored at Moroni's Harley Davidson dealership in Newburgh, New York. You had the option of 16 inch or 18 inch wheels. This has 18 inch, which handled better on the bumpier roads back then. It was the first year of the kidney shaped toolbox, which lasted up until the mid 50s. The 1940 thinned the timing cover and went to heavier flywheels in the engine to make it run smoother and different porting in the heads. Nineteen forty was the only year for the small round air cleaner which had been an option in the late thirties. It was the first year for the metal tank emblem and the only year without sergeant stripes which ran front to back on the tank. The shifter lever. The speedometer mounted on a dash between the two gas tank caps. This was the first year for the oval running boards, which were standard until 1965. Notice the Harley Davidson Motor Company badge emblem on the oil tank. Harley-Davidson's engine design and performance from the knucklehead on created state-of-the-art machines due to input given by famous racer Joe Petralli. In 1936, Joe Petralli set the land speed record of 136.183 miles per hour on the sands of Daytona Beach riding this streamlined motorcycle powered by a 61 cubic inch overhead valve engine. Amazingly, that record still remains unbroken. In the 1930s, The Whispering Shadow was a popular serial. In this episode, the hero, on a Harley, races as fast as he can to warn his friends of an ambush. His friends think he's a robber until they see it's him. Pull up there. Don't shoot it, Jack! The 1941 FL was equipped with a super-powered overhead valve, 74 cubic inch engine, and centrifugal oil pump. The adjustment for the Springer tension is below rather than above the Springer. Double loop straight leg frame. Manual advance and retard mechanism on the handlebars. 
The left hand controlled the spark advance and retard, and the right hand controlled the throttle. This tank has the metal stripes running front to back of the gas tank. This was the first year that the front brake lever was made of aluminum. The speedometer face changed from white to black and silver, which remained standard until 1948. A rare bike of the 1940s, a 1941 WLDR 45 cubic inch flathead. It had the cylinders and heads off a WR, the bigger intake and bigger M3 carburetor, and a standard 45 bottom end. It was designed for competition, but was street legal. Looking at the heads, it almost looks like a 74 or 80 cubic inch flathead. Straight pipes were added back then for performance. You'd ride them to the races, tape up the lights to race them, and then ride them home. On a 45, half the tank was gas and half was oil. The WDLR had larger capacity tanks for running longer endurance events where gas stops would be difficult. This bike illustrates Harley-Davidson's design philosophy. You can see how similar today's heritage looks to this earlier classic. Servi cars had begun in 1932 and were made up until 1974. This is a handbook for a 1966 Servi car. This is a 1941 Servi car. This 1942 WLA 45 cubic inch flathead was produced exclusively for the Army in World War II. It has a large air cleaner for off-road riding, utilitarian saddlebags and crash bars. No civilian bikes were produced in 1943 and 44, and 1942 and 45 civilian bikes are rare. Splash guards for the shins, munitions box, headlight, blackout light, siren, and an optional windshield. On the other side of the light, a Thompson submachine gun scabbard. The metal plate under the bike protects the engine from rocks. During the war, Harley-Davidson turned out 88,000 motorcycles between 1942 and 1945 for the Allied soldiers. In 1943 and 1945, Harley-Davidson received the Army-Navy E Award for recognition of the great performance of these reliable machines. Innovative dealers such as Dudley Perkins in San Francisco bought up surplus Army bikes and bike parts after the war and assembled, repainted, and sold them to an eager public when civilian bikes were hard to find. A 1947 EL 61 cubic inch knucklehead with an air filter still looking like a hair dryer. The nuts on the top of the heads are why they're called knuckleheads. The speedometer mounted on a dash, balloon tires with 16 inch rims, black exhaust, a toolbox, oil tank,
bottom chrome knob is a covered key switch. We asked a friend to stand behind this bike to give you an idea of scale. It has a horn mounted on the side next to the chain. It has a sprung seat and rigid rear. The 1948 125cc single cylinder lightweight, dubbed the Hummer, was introduced for those riders who wanted something smaller and less expensive than a V-twin. A direct line linkage brake with a foot peg. It has a modern foot shift similar to today's. The gas tank is the future Sportster gas tank. Throughout Harley Davidson's history, there has been a special bond between Harley owners. In the past, the founders and executives would travel around the country to visit their dealers and customers, and that tradition continues today. In some cases, people ride hundreds, even thousands of miles to be part of these events. I think the Harley owners group is great. I mean, they, we get the, fa the factory participates in all the events. They have executives here. They ride the motorcycles they build. It's just tremendous, and it brings everybody together. We meet people year after year uh, that we don't see any other time. I can't sleep at night before a run because, uh, you know, it's excitement. We're going to Sturgis in August. In August, they're going to Sturgis. Right. The last time you saw us, we were in San Francisco. We came down. It's taken us two days to get here in Palm Springs. The main reason, of course, is Willie G's going to be here from Milwaukee, and of Let's face it, he's kind of a tradition, and we wouldn't miss riding with Willie G onto Phoenix. There's supposed to be, what, 15, 20,000 bikes in Phoenix, and, uh, ha! God, we'll I be can, a part of them. Oh, I can hardly wait. And so, so we've we had a good time. So we tomorrow morning, 6 o'clock. We asked the founder's grandson, Willie G. Davidson, about his earliest recollections. My father, uh, coming home on all sorts of interesting vehicles, some experimental, and that was always the ex most exciting part of my day when uh, I was a little guy. And I'd hear that thing come around the corner and I'd jump up and down and bang on the window and I and, uh, couldn't wait to get out in the garage to see what he came home on. And uh, there was always a motorcycle in our garage and uh, I, I guess I had the fever early and uh, I remember those days well. I think uh, an important part of the mystique is our heritage. I think if we had ever forgotten where we'd been, and if these things had drastically changed and we had totally lost our identity, uh, people, I think, wouldn't relate, nor would the vehicles be that recognizable. And, and I also, I recall a reading somewhere where they said if if you put the word motorcycle in Webster's uh, next to it, you would have a, like a heritage. And uh, I, that says a lot to me. The identity is there, and it's because it's, it's somewhat historic. This 1949 FL 74 cubic inch pan head is stylistically closely related to a 1990 heritage. It has smoothed out fenders, and the Hydroglide front end introduced in 1949 with hydraulically controlled telescopic forks on the big twins.
think of a Harley, it looks like this. It could well be the illustration next to the word motorcycle in the dictionary that Willie G spoke of. This is a Saturday Evening Post cover from the period. Here's another 1949 FL Panhead. Proof of the Panhead's reliability and sound design is how many are still on the road. This is a 1951 WR Road Racer, part of racer Pat Moroni's collection of vintage bikes. It has been modified for today's vintage racing. Aluminum rims, updated tires, a 1949 Hydroglide stripped down front end. Back then in 51, most tracks were half road, half dirt. They used the same bike for all kinds of racing. The 1950 and 51 were the only WRs that had this type cam cover. It has a three-speed tank shift foot clutch. We asked owner rider Pat Moroni what it's like to ride. It's a blast to ride. <laughs> we also asked Pat how long he'd been racing. Uh, since I was 16, probably 15 years. I started out vintage racing Harleys, um, basically because I love Harleys and I loved racing. And um, right now, the, uh, the Harley was, I thought, the most competitive. This 1952K with a 750cc engine was the forerunner to the Sportster. It's the first Harley-Davidson to have rear suspension. The 74 Big Twins didn't get shocks until the Duo Glide in 1958. It has a foot shifter, folding up foot pegs, and lower brake position, while other bikes still had a rigid rear and tank shifter. It was also the only bike approved by insurance companies for major stars, because it wouldn't go fast enough for them to hurt themselves. This is an article in Harley-Davidson's magazine, The Enthusiast. Harley-Davidson first published The Enthusiast in 1916. It's America's longest continuously published motorcycle magazine. Another article in the 1956 issue announcing some of that year's motorcycle models. So 57 tank emblem was one of the first things I ever did for the company. It was circular, and uh, it had an offset Harley-Davidson in it. That was before I was working for the company. I came on board officially in 1963. This is a 1957 XL with an 883 cc 55 cubic inch overhead valve engine. This high performance sportster ushers in the era of the super bikes. It was a huge success. Also in 57, Joe Leonard wins Daytona, averaging 98 miles per hour.
I bought my first Harley in 1934. It was a 1927. And then in 1958, I bought the uh, one that uh, is in back of us, and that's the green and white Duo Glide. And uh, that was my pride and joy. I kept that one for 19 years. And then the one thing I'd like to emphasize about Harley, when I sold that, after 19 years, I got $400 more than I'd paid for it new. A 1958 FL 74-cubic-inch duo glide with the addition of a rear hydraulic brake and hydraulically dampened rear suspension. This mousetrap converted the foot clutch to a hand clutch. This was one of the hi-fi colors that was available. And of course, once you get to be a Harley rider, you're a Harley rider for life. This 1961 C-Sprint with a unique horizontal four-stroke single-cylinder engine was the result of a collaboration between Harley-Davidson and an Italian firm, Air Maki. A 1966 FLH Electroglide. It was the first year for the shovel head, the second year for the electric starter. It retained the beautiful old-style dashboard and fender tips and some of the pan head trim. Also the mousetrap clutch mechanism. Harley-Davidson had made sidecars starting in 1914 and stopped making them in 1983. William A. Davidson and William S. Harley pose after a fishing trip. A 1967 FLH with sidecar. This was the last year of the steel sidecar. The next year they were made of fiberglass. This sidecar has all the options, rigged front end, steering dampener, and all sidecar attachments. This bike has 4,000 original miles and original paint. This is a 1968 KRTT Lowboy Factory Road Racer, one of seven produced for the Daytona 200 in 1968. The lucky owner rider of this limited edition motorcycle is racer Pat Moroni. This bike has been updated for vintage racing with Mikuni carburetors, newer tires, and an aluminum gas tank. The motor's a 750cc side valve flathead. It was clocked at 150 miles per hour in 1968 with Roger Riemann in Daytona time trials. A bike like this won Daytona in 1968 and 69 with rider Cal Rayburn. Well, I started uh, road racing two years ago. I used to be a professional motocross racer. And I uh, got too old for motocross, so I figured I'd, I'd start road racing. And uh, the first year I... I started road racing I ended up third in the country and I picked up a sponsor with Team Obsolete on a 1973 X Factory XR750 road racer and uh, won the national championship in 1989. Um, Harley only made about 10 of them back in the early 70s. They're a real rare bike. The motor is, is basically the same motor that they they're still using in dirt track 
and still winning national championships on dirt track. But the, uh, the frame is a special frame that Harley made with uh, early Sirianni front forks and um, some other like rare one of pieces that that were made right in Milwaukee in the, in the Harley racing department in the early 70s. In 1971, the FX Superglide with its 74 cubic inch engine entered the market. It was a hybrid outgrowth of the FLH and Sportster. This 1976 MX250 was Harley-Davidson's answer to the motocross threat. They only made them for a couple of years. They were Italian produced and assembled in Pennsylvania. Harley-Davidson had merged with AMF in 1969, hence the dual identification. A 1977 XLCR Cafe Racer. They were produced for two years. It was a bike ahead of its time. It's all original except for the air cleaner. This beautiful 1979 FLH belongs to actor Robert Davi. It has a shovel head 1340 cc engine. Here's his description of what it's like to ride it. I feel like Geronimo on the open plains or, uh, you know, I mean, it has that, it's an individual feeling, I guess each rider has, you know, no matter how depressed or how heavy duty your day has been, uh, you get on one of these and you, you just think about riding. Willie G gave us an interesting personal view of Harley-Davidson owners. I think uh, Harley-Davidson riders are, are really folk artists. I, I firmly believe that. And I, I will never tire of looking at parked vehicles. Uh, at any of these events because there aren't two alike unless they're brand new. I mean, they're, they're either decaled or they're fully painted or they're trimmed or they're accessorized. They're all different and it's a very personal art form, I believe. There's very few Harleys that are exactly alike because everybody is able to personalize them and because the personality is reflected through the bike, uh, I can sometimes be riding on the freeway and even see in the opposite lane somebody coming along. I won't see their face, but I'll see the paint job on the bike and I'll know who's riding, which is what makes the difference between Harleys and other bikes as well. The bike was uh, blue when I bought it, but I'm adding the flames a piece at a time to uh, avoid tearing the bike completely apart and not being able to ride. I've always had like custom ones that I've built, so it's just like my real special space. You know, it's, there's definitely a lot, of, a lot of ego involved and uh, a lot of pride. These are some of the special editions of the 1980s. The 1980s continued in the styling tradition that Harley-Davidson is known for. In 1981, a group of Harley-Davidson executives bought back the company and the merger with AMF ended. This beautiful custom bike, nicknamed the Mayor's Hog, with its Live to Ride, Ride to Live Derby cover, is a 1989 lowrider. It has a custom paint job and custom seat. 
I think everybody's Harley is done to their own likeness. And I guess it's just the personalized touch that you put into it. You know, like it says, the mayor's hog and the, uh, and the color of it. This is a 1990 FXRP police special not available to the public. It is exempt from all emission standards and can reach about 130 miles per hour. Harley-Davidson continues the tradition of outfitting police departments. These officers of the NYPD ride Harleys. This is a 1988 Heritage soft tail that follows in the tradition of the 60s FLHs. forgotten where we've been and I think that that evolution rather than revolution is why we've survived. It is clear that Harley Davidson has created more than a motorcycle. It has created a lifestyle. Not the lifestyle portrayed by Hollywood grade B biker movies, but one based on a love and exhilaration for the open road. Freedom. That sound only Harleys make and the feel of two wheels over four. When you buy a Harley, whether you join a hog chapter or not, you are joining an unofficial club. In this group, it doesn't matter if you're a rock or movie star, a housewife or a carpenter, a stockbroker or a mechanic, a corporate CEO or a small business owner, young or old. In this club, everyone is equal. What matters is the shared feeling for Harley and the road. Riding on their bikes, they all look the same. But underneath their leathers and jeans, there is no one type. As Willie G. Davidson told us, Harley owners are true American folk artists. And true to that idea, they have created not only their own bikes, but their own style. Harley is more than a motorcycle. It's a state of mind. It used to be more segregated, but it's today it's anybody can buy one, <laughs> you know, and feel good on. It. I'm a singer and a songwriter. I'm an ex bodyguard. I'm a business manager at Hughes Aircraft Company. What do I do? I'm in the army. And what do you do? I'm an engineer with Ford Aerospace. We fly satellites for the Air Force. You wouldn't believe me if I told you, but I am. I'm a registered nurse. I work in the, in the uh, emergency department over the local hospitals. I'm in materials procurement. I'm a construction inspector for Los Angeles County. I'm an attorney. I'm a builder. I'm the editor of Hot Bike Magazine, the magazine for Harley Davidson riders in which the women have their clothes on. <laughs> I work as a production associate and associate director on a TV show. I'm a uh, planner for uh, North American Rockwell. I work in an office during the day and I play uh, rock and roll at night. I'm medically disabled. I'm a heart patient. I'm an assistant manager for Star Control. I work for the warehouse. Well, I own a restaurant in Santa Monica. <laughs> Chairman and CEO of J.W. Robinson's company. I own an advertising agency. I own an advertising agency. <laughs> I'm a lab tech. I work in a hospital. I own a carpet cleaning company. We're in a retail business, retail store. I'm in the landscape maintenance. I'm a housewife. Well, a plumbing inspector for the city of Los Angeles. I'm president of wine distribution services. I'm an electrician. Uh, I'm a stockbroker. That's what I do for a living during the week. I don't look like this. You'll see me in a suit and tie. But Saturday morning, get out the leathers and, <laughs> and start riding. Harley Davidson will always stand for freedom, independence, and the open road. Its place in history is assured. It remains and will forever be a legend. We don't fuss. We don't fight. 
Oh, 